I think we have solved our technical issues. Um, but just to kind of get started, um, really thank you all for, for being here on this, uh, well, you know, May 5th, the Cinco de Mayo, as some people will celebrate, but um, on this beautiful day that I know it's very hard to be online. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate your time. And I know everyone has a million Zoom calls and, you know, Google groups and all that kind of stuff. So it really means a lot to us. But today we're going to kind of talk about something a little bit different. Um, and that's something that, you know, I personally haven't seen too much in the news about, but um, is uh, we're going to talk about harm reduction in the age of uh, a pandemic. And this is kind of a compilation of a workshop that um, in the beginning of the, or I guess the middle of the winter when we were planning our spring kind of uh, schedule, uh, we wanted to do a book talk with uh, Professor Nancy Campbell, who's going to be one of our speakers today about her new book about OD and the politics of naloxone and just also the harm reduction um, kind of movement that's been going on in the capital region and then as the pandemic was really kind of hitting we've this is now our third zoom call that we've done is the health autonomy clinic um, that Kathy's going to talk a little bit about uh, the nature lab uh, that we're part of um, the first being kind of a general overview of the medical aspects of the pandemic and what's been going on um, with mutual aid. And then the last one being a DIY mask making. And I'm, I'll go into a little bit of an intro, um, but I'll let Kathy kind of talk first about just what the Nature Lab is and, and kind of how the Health Autonomy Clinic came out of that. Just as a, uh, a few logistical things. Um, so during the, the, the webinars themselves, we just prefer people could uh, keep on mute uh, in case you've never used Zoom before, it just makes everything very uh, a lot easier for bandwidth. Um, if you do have like a burning question during the actual uh, presentation, just try to wave your hand or or make some kind of noise. There's also a at the bottom of your screen. There's a few buttons that are kind of important. The first one is the mute one, all the way to the left. Uh, then there's a stop video, which we are going to record this and we have been posting these on sanctuary TV as well as Facebook so if you do not want to be recorded uh, I would recommend hitting the stop video um, then there are um, is the chat button kind of right in the middle uh, and that will pop up a, a, essentially a text chat that you can chat to everyone you can also chat to specific people so it's very easy um, so if you do have a question and um, something happens with your video or whatnot, a great way to put a question is in the chat box. Um, and uh, we'll put some resources in the chat box and, and it's actually very helpful. There will also be hopefully time allowing uh, some time for questions at the end. So if there are specific questions, um, we can try to, to put that there. And we'll try to answer as many questions as, uh, as we can. All right. Um, and uh, yeah, if there's other technical issues, feel free to chat, to, to message me in the chat, um, just at Frank. But I'll let um, Kathy now talk about uh, the Nature Lab and, and kind of how the, the Health Autonomy Clinic kind of came out of that. Cool. Thank you so much, Frank, and, and welcome, everybody. It's so great to see some familiar faces and others that who are not. And welcome to this really wonderful workshop. And thanks to Frank and um, everybody who's worked on getting it together. So I, my name is Kathy High, and I'm the um, Nature Lab Project Coordinator for the Sanctuary for Independent Media. There are lots of different components and parts to this, this sort of uh, grouping of different projects that are going on. The Sanctuary for Independent Media, which is the website that you've probably been to, which is mediasanctuary.org, is a really longstanding 15-year program that has started in North Troy, and um, lives at, in, in between the blocks of 101st Street and Glen Ave on 6th Avenue with multiple different buildings, plots of lands which have been turned into gardens and, of, and many, many projects. The basis of the projects that the Sanctuary for Independent Media works on include an independent radio station, which if you don't know about it, you should totally check it out. It's WOOC. Um, FM and it's 105.3 FM on your radio dial or you can go and listen to podcasts of radio um, interviews that are all listed online as well which is super important this is a way of disseminating all the information that we're doing of, of projects we're doing 
Um, this is like one arm of our of our uh, the Sanctuary for Independent Media's work, which is all about media, as you can tell, independent media. Um, and then we also work very closely with the arts. The arts is sort of embedded in everything that we do. And finally, Nature Lab, which is the project that I'm the coordinator of, involves things like the gardens that we work with, the food that is produced from those gardens, the kitchens, kitchen that cooks all of this amazing, uh, you know, food that comes out of the gardens. And as, as uh, you might or might not know, we're starting an environmental education center right on the same block, which is we've taken over a new abandoned building, I mean, an old abandoned building that we're making into a new environmental education center that is going to also have embedded a kind of community bio um, DIY lab that is going to offer workshops and training to people throughout the entire block that we live on and then well beyond um, of workshops to, to work on all kinds of things relating to um, biological research and research particularly around um, the kind of environmental justice issues that have come up on in the area that we are in in North Troy. So we're looking at soil issues, we're looking at water pollution issues, we're looking at um, air pollution issues. So there are multiple projects going on. Please join us for workshops. Uh, the, the HAC or Health Autonomy Clinic grew out of workshops that were conducted with the local community and community of the youth who were working on two summers ago. And it was discovered that in fact, one of the things that was really needed was an area within Nature Lab that dealt with kind of trauma and medical um, attention to help people get self-care. And so luckily, very much on the heels of that identification, Frank and, and Frank's partner, JJ, came along to kind of discuss the, the, their interest in creating this health autonomy clinic, which is now, again, another project under the Nature Lab. Nature, the Nature Lab building will house health autonomy clinic in its second floor, and the bio lab will be on the first floor with a classroom. So it's going to be a really incredible space that we hope open in the fall, everything given with all our craziness that's going on now. Um, we always would love and, and, you know, help your help in any way possible. So any support, volunteering, or um, otherwise that you can give us, we really would appreciate. And thank you again. Thank you all for coming. I'll turn it back to you, Frank. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, so my name is Frank. Um, yeah, I've been working with the sanctuary uh, with my partner JJ since uh, the fall, I guess, late summer. Um, and I work as an ER doc in uh, in Samaritan Hospital in Troy, as well as in uh, in Western Mass. And you know, we're really excited to talk talk about a this idea of harm reduction and and kind of how it relates to the age of the pandemic. And like I said, this was a a previous talk that we had talked about pre COVID. Um, and then now we're, we um, saw really fit to kind of reformulate to this. Um, and just, you know, this to kind of like give you a general context, you know, as we settle into this new normal of, of what this world will come to, uh, as we're still within this crisis of the pandemic, uh, we're also beginning to see it's becoming clearer that these social inequity, structural violence that, um, exa that have exacerbated old oppressions um, that, you know, many of us I'm sure have been active um, been have just kind of been removed from the public eye even more so than normal um, and something that a lot of people have been talking about is this idea of this crisis within a crisis that um, you know we hear about horror and detention centers uh, marginalized poor forced to be considered essential workers and, and being forced to go back to work um, the way that capital is consolidating power with uh, what's going on in the senate and among a million others you know I, I, and I'm sure everyone kind of feels this it's overwhelming the tsunami of information that is coming but it's clear to to anyone who is paying attention that these social injustices did not become arrest, er, erased by what the pandemic has caused but are rather erupting uh, in new ways behind the gaze of mainstream attention 
And you know, one such crisis uh, is this so-called opiate crisis, uh, which I know even you know as of last year was really kind of like in the news um, uh, among uh, U.S. mainstream media. And you know, while it's easy to think that these things are random, that they just kind of happen, uh, or worse, and I think especially with the opiate crisis, that these are the fault of victims themselves. It's clear that these crises are created by structural violence and capitalism, uh, among many other factors. And, you know, even in the chaos of this uh, so-called opiate crisis, um, and in, in many crises, you look at the HIV uh, pandemic, not many people are actually talking about. Um, there are many lessons that we can learn from marginalized communities that have, A, come together, uh, practice mutual aid for centuries, uh, well before it ever became a mainstream term, and also built a theory of harm reduction. And, you know, and, uh, other people who are going to talk tonight are going to talk more about the logistics of it, but I think it is a very humanizing way of looking at our relationships with substance use, but also just practices in general. And, you know, specifically around the opiate crisis and something that we're going to talk about today that is very important to this idea of the health autonomy clinic is that these communities uh, forced mainstream medicine to relinquish control over life-saving medications, specifically naloxone, uh, and really giving these communities a sense of autonomy in their own health. And right now I feel like we're kind of in this weird balance between um, going back to normal uh, with the recent protests that the far right has talked about, how Trump is really pushing for everyone to just reopen the economy, but also then this other aspect of this, uh, you know, what I would ask, uh, what I would argue the complete digitalization of our lives. You know, this idea that all human contact potentially is dangerous. Um, it, it would be better for our health if we just did everything online. Um, and, you know, obviously there are many people who would benefit financially and powerfully um, from us living that way. But as we're into now more than 100 days of this social distancing, I, I'm sure all of us are feeling the effects it would have on our mental health and that uh, living online is not a way to live. Um, and uh, just so, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about just how this pandemic has now overlaid on um, a social context that has already been there. Uh, and we can look at uh, the history of pandemics and, and how they previously have always exacerbated uh, issues. Uh, HIV, the HIV pandemic as a great recent example, syphilis uh, in the previous past, TB in the past as well. So today we're extremely excited to have a, a very um, uh, amazing panel of speakers today. Uh, first, we're going to have uh, Professor Nancy Campbell, who's going to talk about her book, uh, OD, Naloxone and the Politics of Overdose, uh, as well as her thoughts on harm reduction, mutual aid networks, and you know what building health autonomy could really look like. She's a professor and department head of science at, uh, and technology studies at um, RPI uh, in Troy, New York. And then we're going to have um, Ariella uh, Zamchek, who's um, a, a DO, a medical doctor here in um, the Capital Region, who's studying at the School of Public Health at SUNY Albany, as well as uh, working with the New York State Department of Health uh, for her fellowship program. Grew up in the Bronx and got her BA at Oberlin and uh, went to University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine in Maine for med school, and then did fellow, uh, her uh, medical residency at Phelps Hospital in Sleepy Hollow and has done a lot of work in harm reduction and, um, and opiate use. Um, then we're gonna have um, Ed Fox, who is the, um, has been working in harm reduction for um, more than almost a decade, uh, has been working with the lead program in Albany, the syringe exchange coordinator, and uh, currently the harm reduction manager with Project Safe Point. Has been working a lot in Albany, uh, as well as the surrounding 12 counties uh, that he'll talk a lot about. And then we're joined by um, Jasmine Landry, who's a third year med student at Albany Medical College and has been working in harm reduction and advocating for patients who use drugs uh, for a long time in her short career in the, the medical uh, institutions, as well as uh, Leah Miller Lloyd, uh, who recently just graduated or is about to graduate from Albany Med and will be starting her residency in LA, I believe. Um, and has been working a lot with Project Safe Point, as well as previously before med school, the San Francisco, San Francisco Syringe Access Services. So we have a very full schedule. 
Uh, and we're going to try to keep everyone on time as much as possible. And um, so again, if you have any questions, if it's a burning, burning question, just try to wave your hand, get somebody's attention. Um, you can also put it in the chat and we'll try to address it um, uh, in a timely manner. There will also be time for questions at the end. Okay. Are there any questions right now? I know that was a lot of information. All right, I don't see any, any frantically waving hands, so that's good. <laughs> All right, and then um, I'm gonna let it off to uh, Professor Nancy Campbell, please. Looks like the slides came through. All right, so tonight um, I'd like to tell a little bit of a brief story about how harm reduction as a social movement came to be practiced in the middle of uh, the HIV and AIDS and opioid epidemics, which have been in various ways underway since uh, the mid to late 80s. And how they intertwine with COVID-19 is kind of, uh, because I'm a historian of the present, I'm very oriented towards how is this, um, how did this come to be um, our current um, reality? So, in many ways, we are now all practicing harm reductionists. Now that's interesting, that doesn't wanna move. Hmm, I didn't, uh, hmm, there we go. Um, so we're all practicing harm reductionists now and we're all being very pragmatic. We're doing what makes sense within the confines of our everyday lives. We're really assessing our concrete conditions. And I know that Ed is going to talk a little later about the tenets of harm reduction. So I'm not gonna go into that, but instead to talk a little bit about the ways in which the tools of harm reduction are always changing from clean needles and naloxone to masks and pulse oximeters things that I barely knew how to say a few weeks ago. But the practice and the philosophy remains any positive change, as you see here from the Chicago Recovery Alliance. And I will um, explain and tell you a little bit more about where that comes from in a little while. Oh, I did want to make sure that you all caught the um, vehicle for positive change right across the top of the truck um, that Steve is standing in front of. Um, now. First, I want to emphasize, uh, and there won't be a lot of these kinds of graphs, uh, I'll warn you right now, I'm um, not going into the sort of data side and the many questions about what counts as an overdose and who counts overdoses and those kinds of things. But I want to emphasize that opioid overdose is local. It's a local phenomenon that takes shape in relation to local drug markets, licit and illicit markets and subcultures of use. And I realize that we're used to thinking about this as a national phenomenon, but I'd like you to shift that frame a little bit as I make the point that any epidemic builds upon whatever is endemic, whatever is already in, a, in place and has been in fact naturalized, become the ordinary state of affairs upon which an epidemic, any epidemic builds. Today, pandemic displaces our attention to the epidemics that once preoccupied us, HIV, AIDS, and um, opioids. And so I'm not going to go into this except to show you the modulation points. Around the year 2000, there's a modulation point. And then again, in 2013 or so, there are modulation points in terms of who, um, what substances are involved in opioid um, overdoses. So the unique convergence uh, between OD and COVID-19 has to do with breathing. Both kill essentially through depression of respiration. And if you can't breathe, you enter hypoxia and you die. If you look closely in the left hand lower left-hand corner of this Santa Cruz needle exchange poster from the 1990s, you'll see the beginnings of how drug users learned about respiratory arrest and what they called rescue breathing and got word out to one another in the context of the epidemic that they were living through. So when overdose first came to matter, it was very much understudied, arguably overshadowed by the epidemic attention of, to HIV and AIDS. As drug users and researchers who were working directly with them uh, particularly in San Francisco and uh, somewhat in uh, 
other places as well, they began to realize that antiretrovirals, and I'm skipping a lot here, I'm skipping way ahead in my story uh, because this is a very compressed version of it. Um, they realized that uh, it was becoming possible to live with AIDS. And they began to notice that more of their friends were dying from things like hepatitis C, um, but especially overdose. And um, to bring this realization to notice, and, and they, they came to this partly from talking to drug users themselves and realizing how many overdoses they were witnessing and how many of them had witnessed overdose deaths um, in, in their young lives. And so they, uh, people who were thinking about overdose had to counter several myths that had become very commonsensical. And uh, one was that overdose deaths were abrupt and couldn't be survived. There wasn't really time to intervene. The second was that purity was the only thing that really mattered. And uh, the third was that abstinence was protective. Countering those myths were observations and experiences. Polydrug use, combinations of opioids, benzodiazepines, and alcohol kill many more people than do um, overdoses from pure um, opioids. Abstinence is not protective. In fact, it's a risk factor for overdose death um, because reinitiation of opioid use after tolerance has dropped, whether it's a consequence of being in treatment, in abstinence-based treatment, um, which I'm not a fan of, I'll have to say. Um, I'm very... Um, much a uh, proponent of medication-assisted treatment as a result of my uh, sort of partisanship um, as a um, historian of science and medicine who's concentrated on opioids almost all her career. Um, so if tolerance drops consequent to treatment or incarceration or interruption of supply, that's a very risky condition. So once harm reductionists realized how naloxone could be used to save lives, they took these matters into their own hands and began to educate one another. And they did it through a variety of means. And the one that I'm gonna show you a lot of tonight is the Santa Cruz Needle Exchange Zine Junk Food, um, which has these kinds of collages at, like the one I'm showing you here. But if you notice down in the editor's note, um, uh, where uh, they talk about Narcan, that's Nalox a brand name for naloxone, is the only thing that will really work in a situation of opioid overdose. And so they begin to make creative bargains with anyone in their environment who they can bargain with. Um, they um, barter to get naloxone from hospitals and hospices and EMTs, and they embark on decades of work uh, to get policy and law to conform to their sense of harm reductionist morality. And that is what enabled them to wrench uh, the tools of harm reduction out of the hands of medicine, uh, because there were friendly EMTs and there were people who understood what they were trying to do. So um, this um, kind of educational materials and trainings and uh, protocols and support groups. This is uh, the Scare Me protocol, which was one of Chicago Recovery Alliance um, protocol, early protocols. This is a later uh, flyer that they did. Um, and you'll see SARS Maxwell's name and Sean DeLatter, um, uh, and you don't see Dan Biggs' name, but he um, was the person at CRA who was really putting a lot of that together. And uh, you see that they had to work with physicians who were friendly to harm reduction and who would prescribe naloxone. Um, and eventually that led to standing orders. So the standing or the CRA standing order was one that most of the naloxone in, in the whole country um, was, um, was legal uh, because of that standing order. So my book follows the trail of naloxone, which the FDA approved in 1971. And I just want that date to sink in a little bit for us. That is almost 50 years ago that the FDA approves naloxone. There had been a former opioid reversal drug called nalorphine, which I also write about in the book, which had been used by police to detect um, um, 
whether someone was um, an addict or not, uh, or an opioid user or not. Um, they, uh, so while naloxone is far from the only tool in the harm reduction toolbox, it's especially interesting to ask why it took so long for it to get into the hands of those who need it most. Today, of course, you can call up your local county public health department. You can get curbside or postal delivery of naloxone. Um, the uh, in interesting nasal naloxone, I mean, in the old days, uh, they were glass vials that had to be loaded um, into syringes, but uh, drug users were fairly good at that. Um, and so it worked fairly well. Um, and so for me, it's always very interesting. Now you can go into some pharmacies in many states and get naloxone, no questions asked. So how did the world you know, get remodeled in this way? So I wanna tell you a quick origin story. Harm reduction is usually attributed to having a European origin. Here is um, Amsterdam, one of the first pharmacies to, to uh, sell, give out clean needles, and the syringe exchange scheme in Liverpool, um, England. And uh, their proponents of harm reduction shaped a new public health uh, that was very much focused on bloodborne viruses. And I think that's the interesting thing about where we are now is that a lot of harm reduction was really evolved uh, specifically um, for, I mean, CRA was vaccinating lots and lots of, of of people, and they were really uh, focused on uh, bloodborne viruses uh, no longer, right? Is that the case? You also saw in the US, um, as opposed to uh, Australia or the UK or other places in um, Germany, where uh, harm reduction or the Netherlands was um, infused, in the US there had to be considerable activism about it. And this is ACT UP New York, um, and they started, that the longest action that um, ACT UP ever, ever mounted was the Lower East Side Needle Exchange, um, uh, which is now the harm reduction um, uh, uh, coalition. So these were illegal, right? Naloxone and needles were illegal according to paraphernalia laws. And that is why in the U.S. you see groups like the Needle Pirates in Seattle, right, who delivered naloxone in quantity to um, punk and metal communities. You see Dave Purchase in Tacoma setting up a national clearinghouse for needles. You see Dan Big at CRA setting up a national uh, clearing house for naloxone. Um, these were not activities that could be funded um, by government. Private foundations like the Comer Family Foundation had to step in um, in order to make sure that um, needle exchanges uh, could, could survive. And there was quite a um, talk, right, during that kind of period of time. Here you see a very large, it's called a chicken, um, 100 needles uh, being given out in San Francisco. And you begin to see in the 90s, so 19, this is a 1993 photograph that contains almost all of the, you know, Edith Springer's there. She's considered the goddess of harm reduction. Uh, Dan Big is there in the front row in the white shirt. Um, and many of um, the people who were initially involved in the starting of what ultimately became came uh, the Harm Reduction Coalition. Ah, you see Heather Edney in the back row, in the middle of the back row. She's the person who um, helped to, who, who really started junk food, the Santa Cruz needle exchanges, a very educational uh, guide to what to do uh, should you encounter an overdose. So it's a very diverse group. Harm reduction, um, however, tended always uh, to situate expertise in, um, in the people and not in the leadership. Uh, they did a lot of listening and a lot of uh, bottom-up kind of under, trying to understand, well, what are the problems? What are the issues? What are the health concerns um, that drug users themselves have? If you look at this one, um, you'll see, this is a Santa Cruz needle exchange um, collage, you know, be, because we are the experts, we are the authorities. Um, in January of 2000, um, a, a Soros-funded group met in Seattle uh, to figure out how naloxone could be distributed in order to prevent overdose deaths in a much more systematic, scaled-up kind of way. And that is what brought national and international um, 
advocates together for the first time and people began to realize how different the harm reduction movement was in the United States where we had to work much more much harder much uh, more actively um, so that's the organized side of the story but there's also a lot of proto history from below that I tried to dig up in the book um, so for instance um, someone high up in the mountains of New Mexico would barter homegrown weed for an EMT's case of naloxone and use it to revive community members who overdosed when there was no time for the EMTs to get out to rural areas. In 2001, New Mexico would become the first state to legalize naloxone distribution. Uh, prior to that, people would be arrested um, you know, for naloxone uh, distribution. And that also helped to infuse harm reduction into New Mexico's health care for the homeless. A lot of naloxone activism in the states and in the UK has taken place um, through Housing First and, and uh, Healthcare for the Homeless um, because of where overdoses tended to take place. And if they tended to take place um, in homeless shelters or what are called hostels in the UK, um, people would use those as um, points, distribution points, right, to get um, naloxone um, to the people who needed it most, but where they needed it most. Another real tenet of a harm reduction. Other states, of course, followed over the next 20 years. In 2012, the Rensselaer County Sheriff's Department became actually one of the first in the country, in the entire country, to carry naloxone. And as harm reductionists began to reach out um, to first responders and local governments, county governments, um, that including firefighters and law enforcement, you have to just kind of imagine that a little bit, all right? Because um, these are officials who they once avoided during their decades underground. Um, and so then you begin to see the movement begin to permeate public health and social services um, in a much uh, bigger way. This is the, um, the last uh, Chicago Recovery Alliance uh, report in which Dan Big appeared alive. He died later. Um, that year, but um, you, you must understand that harm reduction takes so many forms, but is generally recognized, right, as what they say it is here, you know, a pragmatic philosophy that's based on reality-based assessments of what an individual or community's actual risks of harm might be, and concrete practices to reduce that harm in ways that, that can be integrated into everyday lives, right, not things that people won't do, but um, in other words, this was a very, it was kind of a deprofessionalized and demedicalized approach to health that has in recent years, because of its uptake by local government, um, it, uh, but it's always em emphasized people taking agency and embracing autonomy in ways that are empowering for local communities. Um, I want to just ask you very quickly, Frank, um, because I have completely lost track of time, um, how much time I've got left. Uh, technically, no time. But <laughs> None. All right. OK, um, then that's good, um, because that was my that that can be my last slide. I, I wanted to show you one more um, because I think it's uh, really interesting that this movement became so interested in um, producing evidence of the efficacy of naloxone. So on the one hand, it seems like everyone would think, oh, well, naloxone, it just works. Um, but no, this movement um, all over the world had to uh, partner um, across these kinds of professional lines in order to produce the evidence that naloxone works. And so there's been, I call it evidence-based activism in my book. Um, and of course, it's both um, a beauty and a curse um, because um, the meaning of evidence, of course, changes depending upon uh, who you are and what community you're in. So um, the book ends with, and I will end with, uh, the need to create a harm reduction infrastructure. But my sense is that the rest of the speakers tonight are gonna speak to that kind of harm reduction infrastructure. Um, we need, I think, a healthcare system um, that um, is more oriented towards harm reduction than it has been in the past. And so thank you very much for your time and attention. Great, thank you so much. Oof, all right, a lot of history. That was great. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Um, and we'll, um, we'll have links on the, uh, the site has the, the full title of the book and uh, uh, more, uh, more information about it on the, uh, on the chat. Well, now we're gonna move to kind of more of this idea about harm reduction uh, with uh, Dr. Ariella Zamchek, um, who has done a lot of stuff in her career around harm reduction and um, uh, needle exchange programs. Sure. Thank you so much, Nancy. I can't wait to read your book. It looks so much fun. So thank you for the introduction. I'm a family medicine physician and right now I'm doing a fellowship in public health with the Albany School of Public Health and New York State Department of Health. But way before medical school, I did an AmeriCorps year in a San Francisco homeless health clinic called the Housing and Urban Health Clinic. And this really opened up my eyes to what harm reduction was and what it could do to, to change an entire community. So I worked with homeless adults um, who were put on a fast track to housing. Um, and the initiative came from, from them themselves as well as through a partnership with physicians. And that is really what inspired me to go into medicine. So I really kind of got this crash course in harm reduction principles um, that, that changed my life and made me realize how much positive influence a physician in the field of harm reduction could do. So Nancy gave an incredible overview. So I'm just gonna to touch on a little bit. So harm reduction refers to the wide range of public health policies, which are designed to decrease the negative social or physical consequences that are associated with various human behaviors. So we can open it up to think of it not just in terms of substance use, but in terms of any of the many human behaviors that we all do that have negative consequences. And I also wanted to talk about harm reduction in some other contexts, building off of a little bit of what Nancy just spoke about and um, sharing some other ways in which the principles of harm reduction are used. So as Nancy really did sort of hammer home, harm reduction reinforces human rights by placing autonomy of people front and center. And any interventions that are aimed at preventing the harm really need to involve the people who are the targets of that intervention. The concept of nothing about us without us was really started by the HIV movement, but co-opted to apply to modern harm reduction. And it's really important to think of this in terms of any intervention. And Nancy, I'm sorry, if I'm, if I'm getting history wrong, please write it in the chat box so I can stand corrected immediately. Um, so we've heard about naloxone or Narcan initiatives, and we'll hear a lot more about needle exchanges, but I wanted to bring up the concept of safe or secure injection facilities or supervised injection facilities as a major, major boon for the harm reduction movement in terms of, of addressing people with, with substance abuse and really kind of approaching with a very compassionate uh, manner um, people who use drugs. So a safe injection site is a place where injection drug users can self-administer drugs that they bring themselves in a controlled environment under medical supervision with trained staff who are trained in the use of naloxone and life-saving measures and also can provide access to care um, either through, through facilitating appointments, through conversations that lead to access to care, and through, through partnership. Um, they can also be used to provide clean needles and the works, the other kind of um, components of, of drug use that are necessary for prevention of blood-borne diseases such as HIV and hepatitis. And we have seen tremendous success in decreasing HIV transmission through the use of, of needle exchanges, which is why it's so important. This used to be the major cause of HIV transmission, and now it, is, it has decreased tremendously in our country thanks to the success of needle exchanges. So this is very important. But the other amazing part about what a safe injection facility can do is really bring, bring people together, create conversations, and start a process of incremental change um, that can lead to people really being able to to access um, substance abuse treatment if and when they are ready to do that. And these sites most importantly are maintained and supervised by people who use drugs and they also can adapt to changing environments. Um, there is one an incredible site in Canada, in Canada called Insight in Vancouver, which is a site of such tremendous research about the, 
about the nature of the of the um, of the effects, how it influences the surrounding city, and what we've seen is that all of these negative consequences that were thought to be associated with safe injection facilities did not come to fruition. Um, there was a fear that they'd lead to more drug trafficking and more violence in those areas. In fact, they led to decreased drug trafficking and decreased violence. Um, it has decreased deaths related to overdose and has increased access to services. Unfortunately, in the US, to this date, there is not a single safe injection facility in existence, and that is because of a 1986 law that we kind of call vernacularly, vernacularly the crack house law, which makes it illegal to knowingly operate a facility in which drugs are used. So thanks to this, despite the fact that there are informal SIFs, safe injection facilities, really in various parts of the country operating right now, none of them are legal. However, there's some very positive news. In February, a federal judge in Philadelphia ordered that this law does not violate, uh, um, does not, um, that SIFs do not violate this law um, because they are associated with overdose prevention purposes. And so a group in Philadelphia is moving forward with plans to open what may be the first legally sanctioned um, safe injection facility in the country. So that's very, very positive. Um, in New York, there was a major study looking into both cost benefit analyses and the most like most helpful places for for SIFs to be placed, um, but that was blocked by by the state government because they did not want to operate in violation of the federal law. But if this can actually go through in Philadelphia, then we may start to see safe injection facilities um, grow across the country, which I think would be incredible. Um, so we've spoken a lot about opioids, but I just sort of wanted to change gears to talk about some other, other ways that, that harm reduction is used. And as a member of the electronic dance community, one organization that is really near and dear to my heart is Dance Safe. So Dance Safe is a public health organization that promotes health and safety in nightlife and electronic music communities. It's been around since 1998 and it was started and continued by musicians, attendees, and organizers of dance spaces across the globe. And one of their goals, among their many goals, is to promote harm reduction in peer-based popular education and help people make informed decisions about drug use in dance spaces. They're known for bringing pill testing kits to nightlife events and educating people on their use. You can visit their website at dancesafe.org and you could actually order pill testing equipment. And also um, they have a, a very thorough series on testing, on the pros and cons of testing, and um, information on many different drugs. So their goal is not to condone or condemn drug use, but to inform people and make sure that this, the use of drugs in dance spaces is, is as safe as possible. And also through this growing kind of acceptance of harm reduction, we're beginning to understand that drugs are used both for um, benefit enhancement. Uh, as physicians, we think of benefit enhancement and benefit maximization. So people use drugs for a reason. They don't use drugs because they're bad people. They don't use drugs because they're necessarily forced to. People use drugs because maybe they have underlying psychiatric uh, diagnoses, histories of abuse, needs to get through the day, whatever it is, there's a reason why people use drugs and actually understanding that and, and researching that can allow us to actually better treat people. And one of the, one of the growing fields right now is, is studies in the ways that actually drugs considered drugs of abuse can perhaps have therapeutic benefits. And one area um, that is being looked into is the use of MDMA um, which goes by um, ecstasy or molly as a therapeutic tool for people for treatment of PTSD, as well as psilocybin, which is a psychoactive uh, property in uh, magic mushrooms, which has, which has very positive results right now in um, use for chronic depression. And you can read a little bit about these ongoing studies through MAPS, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. They have a full, um, full rundown of all current research projects and, and goals 
And it's, it's a really interesting time right now because we're kind of going back to the great work that was being done in the 50s and 60s before the war on drugs kind of halted progress on actually looking into therapeutic use of drugs that have been terribly maligned in, in popular culture. I'm gonna shift completely another, again, to, to go back to something that Nancy mentioned, which is Housing First. So Housing First is a harm reduction initiative aimed to provide housing to homeless individuals without requiring that they abstain from drug use, attend any programs, demonstrate improvement, or, or jump through any hoops. The principle is that housing is an essential intervention and housing should happen before any, any other steps are taken. And this has been shown not only to reduce costs of medical and social care, but also to improve clinical outcomes, especially for individuals living with HIV and AIDS. So this is part of the work that I was doing um, in the Housing and Urban Health Clinic in San Francisco, was working with people who had um, chronic, chronic um, illness diagnoses like um, HIV, um, as well as diabetes and substance abuse, and working with them to, go, to be placed on a fast track to housing, permanent supportive housing. There are different kinds of housing structures, but permanent supportive housing, not in a shelter, not in a temporary facility, but in a stable home where they could access wraparound services like case management and nursing care. And that is in, the, in and of itself a very powerful harm reduction technique um, to put people who are homeless directly into homes um, and not put place any judgment or bars on their, on their housing based on any behaviors that they engage in. So harm reduction, as we've been discussing a lot, refers to interventions aimed at reducing the negative effects of health behaviors without necessar necessarily extinguishing the problematic health behaviors that they came from. As a physician, I often think of harm reduction as they relate to patient care and treatment plans. And in doing that, really going beyond substance use to think of how harm reduction can apply to many different circumstances. Many people engage in practices that are not completely healthy, poor nutrition, lack of physical activity, and tobacco use are all examples of behaviors that can be approached through the lens of harm reduction. Many of these habits are related to social and economic contexts in which they occur, and the structural violence that is inherent in many healthcare facilities in the form of racism, xenophobia, or exclusionary practices that make it very difficult for people to access care, keep them from, beginning, from even, even, even beginning to be able to approach any kind of treatment. So ways to approach patients through the lens of harm reduction involves first understanding the reasons why these harmful behaviors are done and in what context they occur, understanding the benefits of these, these behaviors, and then working with patients to achieve realistic goals that are set in partnership with the patient. Small incremental changes should be acknowledged and appreciated, and relapses and failures should not be punished. It's, it's part of being human. A harm reduction approach really must recognize all the ways that institutions systematically deny people of basic needs and must fully understand the barriers that exist. These not only affect people's vulnerability to drug use and other harmful behaviors, but reduce their capacity for dealing with it. I just wanted to finish from a, from a wonderful quote from Monique Tula, who's the executive director of the Harm Reduction Coalition. When we talk about harm reduction, we often reduce it to a public health framework, one of reducing risks. That is harm reduction with a small HR, but harm reduction with a capital HR, this is the movement, one that shifts resources and power to those who are most vulnerable to structural violence. So thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you for that quote. And uh, we put some of the links that you mentioned uh, in the chat, the Dance Safe and the maps as well. So thank you so much. Um, well, just uh, maybe to give everyone a little break, um, if, if you're near a window, I encourage you to maybe look out the window. If you're not near a window, that's fine too. Um, but just to close your eyes, Ooh, take a huge, huge deep breath. Take one more big breath with your eyes closed. You know, these kind of heavy topics in heavy times, um, but, uh, but it's a beautiful sunny day out, so it's really nice. So. All right.
Well, thank you for that. We're um, so uh, we're gonna keep moving because, uh, as expected, we're a little behind schedule. Uh, but next, we're gonna have Ed Fox, who's gonna talk about his work uh, with Project Safe Point as well as with uh, Catholic Charities. So, Ed, we'll uh, we'll give it to you. And I think we have some slides. Yeah, perfect. Sorry, I needed to unmute myself there. Okay, thank you. Great to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Project Safe Point and the work we do around harm reduction in the Capital District. We work in 12 counties surrounding the Capital District. We've been doing this for a long time. We do well, you know, an array of different services, harm reduction services. Um, so you know, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to, um, to share this information uh, with everybody on here today. Um, you know, one of the things for us has always been getting word out there, letting people know these services are there, letting people know these services are here in your communities and people, you know, need to be aware, they need to know that, you know, yes, we're here for you, yes, we're going to support you, no, we won't judge you, there is no stigma attached to the services we provide. And, you know, as I go down to um, some of the slides here, I, I put up a few slides that are, you know, basic slides, but very important slides in you know they demonstrate and highlight the principles of harm reduction and how we work with people how we work as effectively as we possibly can work with people um, because stigma is such a huge thing engaging people engaging our population is a huge challenge anytime we hire staff for any of our um, programs one of the key skills one of the key pieces that we look for is can you connect with people can you engage people because if you can't engage people you can't work with them and you can't do the work you cannot deliver the services uh, the very vital services um, that need to be provided for people so i do want to just you know move down through the slides if we can i'm in control of them <laughs> thanks ariella uh, so you know this slide is one that i always use whenever i talk about our work i like to sort of um you know highlight this uh can we just go back again? thank you uh, just to sort of show what exactly the principles of harm reduction really are and you know this is not new stuff I mean, most people here will know this but it's good to sort of you know reinforce it and to you know always you know show that we we try to stick with um these principles as we work with people we have health and dignity we want but there's a lot of health issues that are associated especially with uh, you know problematic drug use injection drug use Patient center is a very important one for us. We know we are, a, you know, a person-centered approach to harm reduction. So it's you know within the person. Again, as Nancy uh, mentioned earlier, it's always going to be and Ariella. It's always going to be patient involvement. You know, there's going to be no success without the patient and without uh, their contribution. And it's your body, so you make your decisions around your body. The same with patient autonomy. Obviously, we recognize inequalities and injustice. Um, you know, that's something that's a huge part of like harm reduction and, you know, recognizes poverty, class, racism, social isolation, past trauma, sex based discrimination, and other, excuse me, social uh, inequalities affect people's vulnerabilities and capacity for effectively dealing with, uh, with drug related harms. And it's always um, practical and realistic because. You know, one of the things with harm reduction, there's no, you know, when we do definitions of harm reduction, we, like there, there's no universally recognized definition of harm reduction. Harm reduction encompasses a lot of different things. You know, abstinence can be part of harm reduction and, you know, safety planning, you know, managed use, all of these are, you know, part of, uh, of harm reduction. So it's important to, um, you know, to be able to, to recognize that and acknowledge that. And, you know, these are the principles that we work with. Next, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, again, you know, I'll like quickly through this, but it's just what I've been talking about. You know, this is just a quick snapshot, um, you know, recognition of you know, what harm reduction is. I'll just move on to the next slide as well, fairly quickly, because this is important. This is an important, uh, you know, slide in demonstrating how we work with people um, and who we work with. We work, you know, in on the sort of the continuum of care. We say this often, we don't, um, you know, just work with one group. We work across the continuum. We work with a lot of people in pre contemplative stages uh, of change uh, and the contemplative stages of change. As I 
speak about our uh, Lyme service um, when that slide comes up uh, next. You know, we'd be, you, ideally I would like to have gone through the through the um, lines of service and being able to refer to this a little more. But I, you know, I it's important to we put this up here and you guys can see this. So you know, the pre stage where, and I'm talking about our syringe exchange program now that we have people coming through who are, you know, they're comfortable with their use and they're. You know, just starting to think about things. They're looking at maybe getting some clean needles, um, clean works. Um, so you know, they're at that stage, the confidence stage. They're maybe thinking about having a conversation with one of the people they meet at the syringe exchange program. You know, asking questions a little bit about you know what things might be like if you know maybe cutting down a little bit on use, maybe doing one bundle instead of two bundles. Uh, so, you know, this, this is a lot of the work that uh, we're working with a lot of people at, at that stage. Obviously the preparation stage, it's when people are getting ready to, um, you know, take some action. Um, action stage is then, that's when, you know, people are getting ready to sort of, you know, maybe think about going to treatment, whatever that might look like for them. You know, what, you know we obviously won't be pushing anybody to move into any particular kind of treatment, but whatever works for them, you know, let's see what you're thinking. And then obviously that's, you know, moves on to the maintenance stage where somebody has, um, you know, maybe going to treatment, maybe, you know, seeing medication assisted treatment, whatever treatment has been working for them. And obviously relapse is something that's always there. We work with a lot of people around relapse. Um, relapse is part of, you know, is part of the whole, you know, stage of behavior change. So it's, you know, very much, all this there in all of the stages. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so I've come to mostly talk about uh, who we are, what we're doing, practice safe points. So we're a public health program. We provide harm reduction services for uh, people who use drugs in the capital district. Um, we, are the, we are the harm reduction program in this area. We are uh, funded by the um, AIDS Institute at the Department of Health. They pay for all of our services. We're grant funded. They, you know, pay for me, they pay for all of our staff, they pay for all of our syringe exchange supplies, they pay for all the Narcan, they, you know, they're the one to fund our programming. Um, you know, we started off as aid services because as, you know, Ariella uh, spoke about in, you know, the last um, piece, uh, you know, HIV and syringe exchange are such a very in, important uh, combination. You know, I've, the numbers for, um, you know, HIV are, dramatically lower than that's really attributable to um, uh, syringe exchange. So, we, you know, we start like off, as I said, as aid services. So we do a lot of um, HIV, hepatitis C uh, work. A huge part of our work, of course, is overdose prevention. Um, you know, we do Narcan, we give, we've been giving out Narcan kits in this area for many years. I think a lot of people know me know me from Narcan trainings in the 12 counties that uh, surround the capital district. Uh, so, you know, that's a very, very big part of our work. Um, you, you, again, access to Narcan has become, you know, really, it's a, it's a different game now than it used to be. Um, we were the only program doing overdose prevention for the longest time. However, now, as Nancy mentioned, you know, you've got um, counties doing it, and we've got a lot more access to Narcan, and that is so important, and it's so, Great to see that. I, I really hope to have the time to end out with some of the progress we've made in the capital district um, as we come towards the end uh, of the presentation here. Um, okay, so I'm really running out of time. Wow. Okay. Um, again, our goals are to respond to the disproportionate rates of disease and death for people who use drugs, you know, reach this population and link people who use drugs uh, with services that will decrease the negative impact and substance use that increase their safety. So, you know, that's very much, you know, what we're, you know, tasked with doing. Um, it, that's very important. I do want to, before I, you know, I do want to talk about some of the shifts that are sort of happening, especially around the pandemic. I, you know, really hope to be able to sort of, you know, see, how, like, make people aware of how we're addressed. And nothing's changed, and nothing's changed, and everything has changed. Um, you know, really, we are providing syringe exchange is an essential service. Um, thankfully, the governor deemed it as a central service. So we've been operating from the beginning. We have mobile units that are in Albany, Schenectady, and Troy. However, for safety, for the safety of our, you know, of our clients and our staff, we've decided because of crowd control, control and what have you, decided to pull those. And, um, you know, we decided to pull those, but we continue to provide the services. So we're doing special arrangements. We are 
you know, going to the person. So, you know, we have a hotline uh, where people can call and we can, you know, deliver services to them. We have increased our peer delivered syringe exchange, which is a very, very important piece, is a very effective way of having and delivering uh, services. You know, our peer delivered syringe exchange are people who can sort of, you know, distribute um, harm reduction services to their network. That includes Narcan, fentanyl test strips, and all of the other um, you know, harm reduction services that I mentioned earlier. So very, very important. So we are really endeavoring, and we're also looking to partner with more agencies um, you know, in Troy. So um, Joseph House, they have a van in Albany. We're like, okay, we're gonna deputize you to meet some of the people that you're meeting on the street that are not sort of able to um, access the services as quickly as they'd like to. Um, so I, can I just go down one more? Perfect. So, do you, oh, just up one. As a, can I just go up? Up one more. Perfect. <laughs> I sorry. If I can go down just one more, I just want to highlight the um, nine. There we go. So these are the services that we provide. So we have the drug drug user health hub. That's like a single point of access. It's a very fluid sort of, you know. Um, program it incorporates the syringe exchange program the opioid overdose prevention program outreach and engagement street outreach and engagement bridge clinic that's low barrier buprenorphine clinic so we prescribe buprenorphine for people that may not be able to access buprenorphine through more traditional um, programming we have a hepatitis c patient navigation uh, program as well because obviously you know we're about disease prevention um, so that's like the drug user health hub and then we have peer navigation services are, you know, we have staff that are, in, you know, maybe in recovery themselves. They know what it is to sit through detox, working with people who are out there. The law enforcement assisted diversion program, that's instead of arresting everybody for, um, you know, smaller misdemeanors. Uh, let's try to see if they can be connected to um, case management. And, and we have the MAT reentry program at Albany County Jail, which is really exciting. And I'm going to sort of end on you know, that particular program and also the patient navigation program, just to highlight sort of the progress that's been made in this area over the last uh, couple of years. The MAT program at Albany County Jail started last year. Um, you know, we've been working with the sheriff, um, you know, sort of champions of harm reduction have been talking to him and trying to sort of, you know, see if we can get people at Albany County Jail uh, inducted on buprenorphine and that happened last year after much much effort um, so we are working around that that's been a successful successful year in reducing overdose in reducing recidivism and just quality of life for, for people who are incarcerated so that's really really important I do want to sort of highlight that I also want to highlight the patient or so the patient navigation program and how providers have started to change their minds you know, pro um, you know, providing treatment uh, for people who may be still using, as long as they're connected maybe to a syringe exchange program, maybe they're using clean needles and reducing the um, chances of reinfection. So these are two sort of programs that I feel that have, that they do highlight the sort of progress we've made in the capital district over the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, hopefully this continues again things have changed the pandemic has affected um how we deliver services but we will respond to that harm reduction always does and we continue to do so and i will end on that note thank you so much great thank you so much ed that was great and i'm gonna uh put a um just a link to uh the main site for project safe point um in there great Great. Well, just to round us out, we're going to have uh, Leah and Jasmine, who um, were, well, Leah was a, was a med student at uh, Albany Med, and Jasmine is uh, a third year there. Um, and just their experiences with Project Safe Point, um, and also some of their experiences around this idea of, you know, being in institutionalized medical training, but also um, being advocates of, uh, of a, a, a model of work that is looking to deprofessionalize medicine. Uh, among their other experiences. So I'll take it to leave it to you all. Cool. Uh, Jasmine and I are going to try to make this quick so we can leave some more time for discussion. Um, but I think is a really what is a really cool topic that's been talked about through 
um, all of these presentations is who is recognized as experts in these epidemics. Um, and of course, relating also to naloxone and the, as Nancy said, the demedicalization of harm reduction, which I think kind of comes full circle and we'll talk about a little bit. So I think as trainees and medical students, we have this, are in this kind of special place where we get to be a liaison between medical providers who are not that familiar with harm reduction um, and have had very little education about drug use and harm reduction, um, but also being kind of a part of communities and easily being able to do outreach and things like that. Um, and so at times, there are times that we're working in the hospital and um, seeing physicians who are not doing best practices with people with histories of drug use and things like that. And within our own education and institution kind of having to um, do what Nancy called evidence-based activism, which I love that term, uh, and talking um, more about how to better care for people who use drugs. Um, one of the things, Ariella did a really awesome introduction of uh, like what, what a safe consumption space is and how those are super awesome and woohoo. Um, agree. <laughs> uh, one thing I wanted to point out is that a lot of safe consumption spaces, including at Insight, the people that are looking over the people who are using in these safer spaces are not necessarily medical providers, but are people with lived experience themselves. If people who were injecting drugs asked me, a uh, soon-to-be physician, how to help them find a better vein, I would not be able to help them with that because I'm definitely not within that expertise. Um, but someone with lived experience of injection drug use would be much better off. I think that with that, there's a lot that as providers and advocates that we can learn and from people who use drugs and to help um, be a middle person to advocate and help other people take better care of themselves. Um, you know, there's been studies that peers, um, peers meaning people with lived experience of drug use, working within harm reduction and within um, medicine and other, you know, environments, connect better with people who use drugs and are better able to create change that way. Um, and so the, that piece of the picture is a huge part of connecting with people who use drugs and helping people to make changes, having people who um, are better able to relate. Uh, and we mentioned, you know, nothing about us without us, which is a term used in harm reduction sometimes and other um, like trans advocacy and stuff like that. Um, and along with that, I think as advocates, there's the, the saying step up, step back, meaning, you know, we as people in a privileged position, such as as providers or, you know, with the media sanctuary or whatever position that you're in, we can step up to advocate for um, people who don't usually have a loud voice within our society. And at the same time, we can step back and allow them that space to talk. So I'll just be a, a controversial person, which I like to do, and point out that maybe no one on this panel today is at least talking about their lived experience of use and their experiences within the community and changes that have happened with, within this pandemic. Um, within the community. Uh, so in the future, we can include those people in the conversation. Um, I'm gonna let Jasmine go ahead and talk more about kind of how we've tried to bridge this community medical demedicalization divide. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so I think we covered a lot of um, who we think are the experts and who we think really needs to be in charge and um, really involved in harm reduction and caring for all these populations. I think from within the medical system, um, oh, can it? I don't know. Let me see. It says automatic. Is it any better? 
I'll just keep talking. Let me know if it's too quiet. Um, great. And so I think that we luckily um, do have the privilege that Leah talked about within the medical system and within our medical school to really bring um, this information uh, into the system. And so what we have done, uh, really Leah was the founder and I've tried to carry on her legacy here is to uh, really take initiative to educate our own. So we are in a medical system that um, focuses a lot on the evidence, but not necessarily evidence from all sources. And uh, Dr. Campbell sort of uh, hinted at this earlier is that, you know, we can talk about evidence-based activism, but where is that evidence coming from? And will uh, providers and will people with long degrees after their name actually listen to that? Um, and so Leah and I have really started to increase the education to the medical students because a lot of the actual classes that we're getting are not covering most of these things and uh, it's a very um, sort of surface level education. It talks a lot about the pharmacology of drugs and as other people have talked about as well, uh, there's a lot of stigmatizing language around uh, patients who use drugs that really um, perseveres throughout education, unfortunately. Um, we talk a lot about the hidden curriculum of medicine, and this continues throughout people's education, but, you know, in lectures and on paper, it may not necessarily come off as stigmatizing, but in the hallways, the language that you hear doctors um, and other healthcare providers using uh, about patients who use drugs can be very hurtful and then be passed on to the next generation. So uh, we have really spent a lot of time trying to increase education of the medical students, but also expanding that to increase education of the residents, um, of attending physicians, and really trying to work sort of one level at a time at bringing the evidence in to help educate these people and help make them the best providers possible. Um, and sometimes what that means is unfortunately, you know, doing the, um, like the nothing about us without us, except, you know, Leah and I um, don't necessarily have lived experience. And so we always have to sort of have it as a disclaimer, but we do have the privilege of being medical students. And so we can bring in evidence and because of what we look like and because of um, our position, we are able to present this evidence and information in a way that is maybe taken more seriously. Um, and it's unfortunate that that's the way that it sort of works, but uh, in medicine, it can often be a very um, judgmental field in general and can often care a lot about what the presenter looks like. Um, and so it's really important for us to encourage other medical students, other medical providers to uh, really take up the microphone themselves and continue to educate others and not just um, settle for what the norm is currently because the norm is really uh, very inadequate as has been hinted at by other presenters. So, Leah, do you have anything to add? I think that just to add um, with medical students, medical students are um, in my experience, more open to different voices. Um, and so we've had the like awesome opportunity through the New York State Department of Health to have people with lived experience who have gone through a program to be able to um, like do public speaking engagements and having them come to talk to the students, which um, was a super like, successful little discussion event that the students were super engaged and excited about. Um, and I'm sure that there is a place for a similar type of event for physicians, but just not as maybe as easily put together in a formalized way like that. But I, I think that it's a great opportunity to make a space and also be able to provide honorariums for them, which we were able to do, which is a big like issue within the, um, like the use of people with lived experience without compensation. So that's a really important part of it too. So that's it. Cool, great, thank you so Thanks. much. Um, great, well thank you, we have about 10 minutes for a couple questions. Um, 
that people have kind of brought up. Uh, I'll just ask the one um, that somebody started and uh, for all the presenters and uh, anyone else on, um, on the call, if you feel like uh, you're able to answer, please unmute yourself and, and answer away. Um, but Mark asked a question, um, what is the relationship between drug legalization and overdoses? Have opioid ODs dropped in countries like Portugal that have legalized drugs or even states like California and Massachusetts that have legalized marijuana? Uh, so Mark, there's a lot of uh, discussion and it's sort of like uh, dueling evidences um, about what happens if you legalize marijuana, what happens to opioid overdose. Um, I've looked at the studies that have been done and I think they are inconclusive. Um, there are many moments when uh, opioid overdose might drop um it, uh, having to do with market dynamics and things like that um so i'm not completely unconvinced that that couldn't happen but i'm not sure that we have done enough yet to document that it is happening um so that's i guess that's my answer about that legalization of course i mean if if you if you look to the more like the Drug Policy Alliance um, and the, the, the people who have really pushed for legalization, um, they have entered the drug overdose prevention, um, harm reduction, kind of came, came later to the party there, um, but now are very much, um, you know, I would say drug policy reformers and um, harm reductionists are quite um, united in their opposition to um, what the set of interlocking policies that we would call the war on drugs um, and incarceration used as drug policy. So I think that in those cases, right, um, you see um, may maybe, maybe someday there will be a way uh, to show um, that that might actually um, have that effect, that legalization might have that effect. Just not there yet. Um, great, thanks. Um, there was a question uh, from Kathy uh, to Ed about this uh, continuum of care that you mentioned. Just would love to hear more thoughts on that point and what that entails. Um, yeah, so I mean, for us, we, you know, we were working because one of the things, again, when I said about relapse being a reality, um, you know, you're always, you always want to be there for the person. Just because somebody goes through treatments doesn't mean, oh, we're all good now. Um, you know, it's very important that we work through the whole sort of, you know, because we, we safety planning is a very big part of what we do, like safe injecting, wound care, um, you know, you know, making sure people are able to inject, you know, be, making sure that people are using alcohol. So that's all, this is all this safety planning work that we do. And, you know, as we go through the continuum, um, we, you know, our programs are designed to sort of not just, like, not just to, you know, work with people at that stage, because there is other things. There is the housing. There is the sort of, um, you know, the isolation. There is all of the pieces, the support that the counseling is needed. Maybe the sort of treatment isn't the right treatment. So it's like working with somebody through all this, connecting somebody, being able to have the programming that's, um, you know, available. Like I mentioned that our um, uh, MA, a re-entry program, like that's an important program because we are working with a lot of people through the continuum there. A lot of people that come out of jail, you know, they're maybe on, you know, um, Suboxone in jail, but they come out okay. And so it's not necessarily something that's working for them. They didn't want to continue. They're back, you know, doing you know what they're doing. And it's important that we stay connected to them. But then if they want to move on to the content stage again, we're there for that. There's programming there to be able to connect with that. And you know, if there's linkage needed, linkage to um, care required, we're there for that piece as well. And then staying in touch with them throughout the sort of you know post-treatment stage um, and and afterwards uh, because it's one of the things relapse 
happens and it happens uh, post treatment and you know not being connected to somebody is a disservice uh, so just trying to work with somebody right through that continuum is is very very important and you know we endeavor to do that with the programming that we provide so cool great um, this is a question for um, for Lee and Jasmine um, so what can we learn and apply to health disenfranchised? Uh, how can we provide dialogue and support into our uncertain future? Um, I think uh, I would love some clarification on what exactly you mean. So feel free to um, add more in the chat. But I think that as far as um, people who are not necessarily in the medical field, but are just really um, interested in helping this population, certainly um, being a voice because, you know, as we talked about um, looking a certain way and coming from a certain background, whether that means education or um, socioeconomic status gives people a lot of privilege. And so certainly using that and using that voice uh, can be really important and that can manifest in a lot of different ways. So that can mean, um, calling Congress people when bills come out that are really important. And so, you know, getting on the listservs um, from the Drug Policy Alliance, from Harm Reduction Coalition, they will happily email you every day with uh, different bills that are on the agenda and that you can certainly help to advocate for. Uh, it can mean showing up um, in the legislature, probably not right now, I don't think they want anyone there, but um, Okay, everyone in this pandemic who is at risk and doesn't have medical support. Um, can I say something? Yeah. Uh, Brenda, it also seems from what you were saying before about the media sanctuary, like you guys did a really awesome job when you were planning on what is this going to be and like what does the neighborhood and the community need? And so I think that's exactly the, si the kind of um, communication and dialogue that, that we can all do even more or encourage other organizations and and people in positions of privilege to be having more of those dialogues which it sounds like you guys did a great job saying you know what do we need and part of that aspect which led to these talks was we need a space to learn more about our health and be able to take care of our community's health better yeah, and just to add on as far as, um, you know, this place of privilege in a lot of people that can manifest as um, financial stability. And I know that that is really up in the air for a lot of people, particularly people involved in harm reduction um, for a variety of reasons. But if you are somebody who has an extra five dollars, um, I think there are a ton of different organizations that have a lot of really hands on on the ground work. And um, that can be done through direct donations as some people have already put in the um, group chat, but also, you know, for example, we have friends at the Iowa Harm Reduction Coalition, um, which is run by another medical student. Uh, and they, for example, along with many other coalitions, they'll have like an Amazon wish list where you can um, help them by uh, actually buying things on Amazon and it'll ship directly to them and it's things that can be helpful for um, safer snorting kits, safe injection kits, um, hygiene kits, things like that. And so a lot of these organizations are still active right now and putting themselves at risk to do these harm reduction um, practices. And so any sort of financial assistance is uh, very appreciated by all of these groups. So I would encourage you to um, look out for those and there's definitely some listed in the group chat but um i know project safe point i'm sure will be accepting them but you can look as in in your own community as well yeah right so okay we should also be cognizant of the um, current protesters at amazon and respect them too so maybe you can um i don't know go to your local hardware store and buy the equivalent things and then ship them Great, thank you so much. Um, well, it's eight o'clock uh, and as always, there's more questions than we have time for and way more information and um, conversation that we could have, but I think that this was a great start to a much larger conversation. 
And, uh, you know, I think it was really important too this idea of that I, is starting to come out um, in a lot of the, the news about COVID and, and coronavirus is that, um, that this is truly a crisis within a crisis, that there are, you know, if we really want to know who is being the most affected and who, the, the most oppressed by what is going on, is to look to those communities. Uh, and I think the point that Lee and Jasmine really make of um, listening to those communities uh, and, uh, and hearing what they have to say, but also ingesting, like uh, internalizing what the, that means for us as a society, I think is really important. Um, so especially as time goes on, we're going to try to really highlight some of these communities that um, are not being talked about as much as in the, in the mainstream, um, but also as we prepare for this much longer kind of uh, socioeconomic crisis that we're facing, um, you know, what, um, the, the, what our society can do to learn from the past with harm reduction and mutual aid as one example and, and move forward to, to some new kind of way of being. So I thank you all to all the panelists, uh, to everyone for taking uh, you know, some time on a Tuesday evening to stay with us. Um, we're gonna post all this stuff on, um, on Facebook and the Sanctuary, uh, as well as we'll be having um, another event uh, June 2nd uh, through the Health Autonomy Clinic, and uh, we'll send more information out to that. Uh, I'm going to put a, a link in the uh, chat. If you would like to be added to our um, email list, uh, please sign up, and uh, we will add you to our, our very infrequent emails, uh, mainly about events coming up. And um, please consider donating to the sanctuary. Today is uh, Giving Tuesday, so. Um, there's a, a link to the top at the main um, at the main uh, uh, Miss Sanctuary page, as well as uh, Nancy has also put uh, a link to her book uh, through MIT Press on the chat. Uh, as always, be safe, um, enjoy yourselves in this time of, uh, of crisis, and uh, continue learning from each other. So I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you so much for for everything. Thank you. This is great. Take care, y'all. Thank, thank you, everybody. You all, and thank you, thank you, Frank, and thanks for all the presentations. They were really amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, y'all. Oh, it's Ellie.